My name is Donna Epps. I work on Verizon's public policy team, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you to today's program as we continue our discussions around criminal justice reform. Today's program is entitled, Reform Solutions for Women Caught in a Broken Justice System. Our legal system is where every citizen should have equal access to justice and have equal standing in the eyes of the law. Sadly, it's become increasingly clear that inequities plague nearly every phase of our criminal legal system and that too many members of our society are denied impartial access to justice based on the color of their skin or their socioeconomic status. If we're going to make meaningful change to fix the system, it's going to take leaders in the public and private sector working together to push for reform. That's why I'm so pleased that for today's program, we are partnering with the National Organization of Black Elected Legislative Women, Nobel Women. Criminal justice reform is an issue that both Verizon and Nobel Women care deeply about. Throughout its history, Nobel Women has inspired women to take an active role in the making of public policy and has served as a catalyst to provide economic and social justice for all people. They have also had a very intentional focus on improving the lives of women and their families. We are clearly living through a time of tremendous challenge. All of us are confronted with this unprecedented health crisis, social unrest over systemic racism, and natural disasters of historic proportions. And yet, I believe it is also a time of great opportunity. It is during such challenging times that we are often forced to come together rethink what's not working, and rebuild towards a more just, inclusive, and caring society. Which brings me to our criminal legal system. Now, I know some of you may be wondering, why is Verizon talking about reforming the criminal legal system? Well, we support criminal justice reform because we are a company committed to civil and human rights. We support reform because we believe it will make our community stronger and our economy healthier. But most of all, we support reform because the inequities in our criminal legal system and the mass incarceration those inequities have produced is devastating communities and families across this nation. As we talk with our st stakeholders and learn more about the many injustices facing so many people, particularly black and brown people involved with the system, we realize that this is an issue that is impacting our employees and their families, our customers and the communities we serve. And if this is an issue that is important to them, we decided it is also an issue that is important to us. So almost two years ago now, we decided to join the fight to reform the system. We started advocating for reform laws at the federal and state level, starting with our support of the First Step Act, and then moving on to supporting laws in other areas, such as bail reform, uh, parole reform, right to counsel and more. We also started hosting and participating in events like these to bring together the experts, the advocates, and the people impacted by the system to elevate their stories and create greater awareness within the business community about the need for reform. And finally, we expanded our pro bono program to take on juvenile justice cases and to assist people trying to navigate complex expungement laws to get a fresh start in life. So today we want to focus on women who are incarcerated. Over the past 30 years, the number of women and girls caught in the criminal justice system has skyrocketed. From 1980 to today, the number of women in our state prisons has grown by 834%. That's more than double the pace of men. And yet, while we often hear stories about men who are in prison, we hear far less about the unique challenges facing women who are incarcerated. Just in a, as in other areas of society, women all too often struggle in a system that was originally designed with men in mind. Today we will hear from a remarkable and inspiring group of women to learn more about the many challenges women and girls confront before, during, and after incarceration, and more importantly, what can be done to address the injustices that impact them and their families. So thank you for joining us. Next, I wanna introduce you to my friend, President Karen Camper, who will bring you greetings. She is a representative in the Tennessee State Legislature, and she is the national president of the National Organization of Black Elected Legislative Women. Over to you, Karen. 
Greetings. I am Representative Karen Camper, and I serve as the proud president of the National Organization of Black Elected Legislative Women, or Nobel Women. Nobel Women is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, primarily composed of current and former Black women legislators, as well as many appointed officials. Our mission is to increase and promote the presence of Black women in government. Our objectives are to create programs and platforms that advance Black women in the fields of public policy, public service, and civic engagement, to act as a network and support system for Black women in public policy and organizational leadership, to serve as a venue for thoughtful dialogue on issues of public interest between elected officials and stakeholders, and to train and educate a class of cultivated and experienced Black women to assume both governmental and corporate leadership roles. On behalf of our National Board of Directors, I want to welcome you to the event titled Reform Solutions for Women Caught in a Broken Justice System. This event will raise awareness about the devastating toll that incarceration is taking on families nationwide and on promising policies and programs that can stem the tide of despair and break the cycle of recidivism that plagues our present system. I would also like to thank Verizon for their leadership and partnership. We could not have had a better partner for this important conversation. Donna Epps has been such an amazing leader and we appreciate your continued support of Nobel Women. I would also like to thank Michael Brown and everyone else who has helped pull this event together. As someone who has worked on issues of incarceration in my own state, I am thrilled to be working with Verizon on this initiative. As an organization, this conversation could not be more timely. We have recently passed resolutions to change the way black girls are over-policed and underprotected, included being shackled during labor and delivery, and we plan on executing even more policy solutions to help women and children that are affected by incarceration. I am looking forward to this vital discussion, and I am sure this is something that we will all continue to work on. As I close, I want to give a special shout out to Representative Sonia Hopper. She is one of our new board members and will be speaking on behalf of Nobel. I'm sure she will represent us well. Thank you. And I hope this panel is informative and moves you all toward helping shape a better world for those that are impacted by mass incarceration. And now, Kathy Gorillo of Verizon will moderate the panel. Over to you, Kathy. Thank you, President Camper, and thank you, Donna Epps. Uh, my name is Kathy Grillo, Donna Epps' colleague at Verizon in Public Policy and Government Affairs, and I'm honored to be able to moderate this discussion today. I'm gonna start by introducing our panel. First, we have State Representative Sonia Harper from Illinois' 6th District. Representative Harper has been a community activist since she was 16 years old with a passion for promoting economic development and civic engagement. She is also president of Sharper PR Communications and the executive director for Grow Greater Inglewood, a social enterprise that works with residents and developers to create sustainable food economies and green businesses in her community. Thank you, Representative Harper. Uh, next, we have Alice Marie Johnson, CEO and founder of Taking Action for Good Foundation. Alice's story is well known to many of us and one that really illustrates the need to fix a broken criminal legal system. Alice was sentenced to a mandatory life sentence for a nonviolent drug offense and spent nearly 22 years in prison before she was granted clemency in 2018 and later a full pardon. Since her release, she's worked tirelessly to fight for criminal legal reform and for the freedom of others, giving hope to so many other women like her that remain incarcerated. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. And finally, we have Ivy Wolf Turk, 
She is the founder of Project Liberation, where she works with women across all stages of the criminal legal system or who are imprisoned in their lives. She has used her experience in prison to transform herself and has dedicated her life to service and helping others as a professional coach. So thank you all for being here today. Um, Representative Harper, if I could start with you. Women face unique challenges that are often overlooked when we talk about reform of this broken system, and there are many. Um, lack of attention to gynecological needs, screening for breast and cervical cancer, history of trauma and sexual abuse. Um, how should these challenges be addressed? Thank you so much for that question. and Thank you for having me today to be such a part of a wonderful panel. Um, I wanna start off by saying that here in Illinois, eight of every 10 female inmates is a mother, right? And often the primary parent, I believe that their removal from society has a damaging ripple effect on families and neighborhoods. So because there are more men uh, than women in prison, it seems as if our justice system has overlooked the needs of women and many women. For example, we know that a significant majority of women in prison have previously faced sexual or physical trauma and they need that professional help. One of the challenges though that we face is for decades, lawmakers have a perception that they are supportive or care about people who are in prison. And so any action that should be considered common decency was instead viewed as a political liability. So I hope that things are changing now and I see that they are with more conversations like these, but if we wanna make the changes that we need, we first have to factor political will into the, cal into the calculation. I believe that the mass incarceration of women of color specifically has per perpetuated an economic disparity and has had long-term, sometimes lifetime consequences on children and families. And so it can be difficult to break a cycle unless we take the steps necessary to invest in mental health and the other essential needs of women within our communities. And additionally, appropriate legislative oversight must also be a priority to make sure that those things are implemented. We passed so many bills in the state of Illinois, but what we tend to find is that they're not being implemented um, in the ways that they should by the departments. And so just very quickly, I, I think that there should be some serious shifts in the way that women are taken care of while under state care specifically, improved health care. Research has documented that um, born women in prison have higher rates of gynecological issues, higher rates of breast cancer and cervical cancer. So how are we meeting those needs, right? Um, the sanitary the sanitary levels of some of these institutions is subpar. So that's, that, that directly ties to health and well-being. Um, when you talk about we're needing parenting assistance programs and, and more resources for education and skill building, and like I said, trauma-informed care and mental health services. Another thing that we could do also is to address harsh parole rules that could affect recidivism rates. And just to close, training, right? Standards for training and practices uh, should be gender specific. Uh, they should address concerns about strip searches, address concerns um, requiring that mostly male staff be properly trained um, to take on sexual assault reports. This is definitely something that has come up in the state of Illinois as I uh, work to make sure that Illinois is following PREA, the Prison Rape uh, Elimination Act, and working um, to better protect the lives uh, of women behind bars. So I'll stop right there. Much more recommendations uh, on that front. But again, thank you so much for having me as part of this conversation today. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Johnson, I, I'm gonna pick up on um, something that Representative Harper mentioned about the impact on families. Um, Cause I know that you have a unique perspective given your experience. Can you talk a little bit about the impact on families? Yes, thank you so much for having me today. And Representative Harper, you were spot on with some of the things that you said that are impacting women. So thank you so much for the work that you're doing and the work of Noble also, thank you. Yes, having spent all of my time, of course, incarcerated with women, I have a unique perspective, not one looking from the outside in, but now I'm one that was inside, now I'm looking out. So mothers, you talked about so many mothers who are incarcerated and that portion of it is so, that 
That part is so near and dear to my heart because when I went to prison, I was a single mother and I left behind four children. My children were scattered. I had one daughter who had just finished college, two who were in college, and I left behind a teenage son. And my son, who was a teenager, he also wanted to go to college, but without any parental supervision, because I was divorced by this time, I was a single mother, and my ex-husband had disappeared out of their lives, so he had no parental supervision. He ended up dropping out of high school, and he just got caught up also in the criminal justice system. As much as I hate to say this, but my son became my pen pal. I, I was with so many women who faced that same grief that I experienced with their children. They would get bad reports from home and no one to help. And in the federal system, I'm addressing that. You, we, we only receive 300 minutes per month that we could contact our families. That's, fifth, that's 20, 15 minute calls a month. And often we run out of minutes to even speak with our children. We try to mother from the inside. And I saw too many young women who never even were not mothers, who never had, would never get a chance to be a mother because of the draconian sentencing. These laws, our criminal justice system must be fixed. When I was first incarcerated, I was shipped 1,500 miles away from my children. My children could not even visit me in prison until I was transferred to a prison that was closer to home. And just the very impact on the children, on the families, I lost both of my parents while I was incarcerated. They were elderly when I went in and they suffered. Not having me there to be a part of their lives in the winter stages of their lives. But the impact on women is so much, so much overlooked because as Representative Harper said, more of the focus is put on the men because there's a larger percentage of men in prison. But women have become the fastest growing population in prisons. And that, that ought not be so. Many women are in prison behind, I hate to say this, but behind a man, behind their boyfriends or the others who are in their lives. And like me, I was a first time nonviolent offender. I didn't know anything about the legal system. Unlike other things that drive people to prison, many of the driving things is poverty with women. I lost my job. I was, my house was about to be foreclosed on. And I made a terrible decision out of desperation. And I found that so many women were caught up in that same cycle that I was caught up in. They made decisions out of desperation, but that should not cost you your life. How many women should not have been there because they had mental health issues? One of the prisons that I was incarcerated in had a mental health ward for women for mental health in and mental health out. Some could have more contact with the general population and some had to be escorted by staff and they could only be out one hour a day. So if we have identified that these women have mental health issues, why are they in prison? They came in with mental health issues untreated and they're being released untreated with mental health issues. So there is there are so many things that must be addressed from a perspective of how incarceration impacts women. I heard Representative Harper talk about the, the increase in cancer, the increase in other health issues, because we don't get the proper health care that we need in prisons. You cannot compare a woman to a, 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 a female prisoner to a male prisoner who may not need as many checkups. We have unique needs of having mammograms, of having cervical, for to check for cervical cancer. There is a large increase in that. So it has a devastating, incarceration has a devastating impact on women. 
and especially on their children. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Yeah, it's really it's incredible when you think about the impact, the ripple effect of, of what you're talking about with families and children. Um, so thank and you for that. I just want to say it's because it, you can't measure it, it's still there. We feel it and we know it, but you cannot put a number to how many people are impacted because it's, it's, you can't. That is such an important point. Um, so, Ms. Turk, let me let me turn to you um, because Ms. Johnson was talking about, which I thought was a very powerful point about, you know, women entering prison mentally ill and then leaving without any resources after that. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what sort of resources are offered inside and in and what kind of resources do women have on reentry to prepare for life after their release? And what do we need to change? Unfortunately, both inside prisons and jails and upon reentry, there's still very, very little available to address this issue. Um, so many women come from and reenter the challenges um, and trauma of poverty and abuse, um, addiction, and many times poor physical and mental health, as well as the stigma and stress that criminal and just criminal justice involvement puts on them. Um, I can say from my own experience being incarcerated for four years in Danbury Federal Prison, um, the only thing that was really offered to me until we as inmates started to create programming was learning how to knit and crochet. Uh, there were religious offerings, uh, but nothing that really addressed the impact of trauma, the trauma of whatever led to prison. And this is especially acute among uh, justice impacted women, because not only are they 80% of them leaving children and a family behind, but they're leaving elders and, you know, reputations and jobs. And um, there are just so few resources available to them. Um, too many of them will return to prison in three years, um, which unfortunately national statistics have shown us. And while many agencies have mounted ambitious um, reentry programs, nobody is addressing the woman, meeting her on the inside, greeting her on the outside, and dealing with the issues, not in a one size fits all scenario based on a risk and need assessment, but in a way that specifically and individually has to do with her. And while many of these ambitious programs have been successful in helping women uh, get access to education and housing, which, you know, medical care, I mean, none of them are really that successful, but none, none have focused on trauma-informed work unless it's uh, very specifically for the severely mentally ill. And, you know, this is so important for somebody to be able to sustain a home and face all of the things that women face, reuniting with their families, finding a way to come through the trauma and create a living for themselves. They need the emotional and um, social stabilization that's essential for good decision making, problem solving, coping with the further adversity because the punishment never ends once you know you're you're caught up in the system, uh, whether you have restitution or seeing probation or parole officers, there's a stress that diminishes the ability to find one's self-worth and to really have the kind of support and structures that would enable somebody to really feel empowered enough to really go forward. There's a constant pulling back. And so I think you asked what is needed. What is needed is to meet the women on the inside, starting to build that self-worth and self-esteem as they take responsibility for why they made the wrong turn to begin with 
and address the, you know, getting comfortable with being uncomfortable in a prison setting. So when they're released, they have a certain amount of stamina and strength to start with and then greet them and hold them and receive them on the outside and then stand by their sides as they grow, as they learn, as they stabilize and reunite with the lives they didn't even yet dare to dream. Thank you for that. I know that you are, that's part of your work too, is to stand by women after it their is. Thank you for that. Uh, I might shift gears a little bit, uh, Representative Harper, uh, just to talk about public policy. I know at the federal level, the First Step Act has been called just that, the first step. Uh, I'm interested in your views on, you know, what should the second step be? What other reforms um, should be pursued as we continue to look at this issue? Sure. So the First Step Act, which I am proud of, was sponsored by my Illinois Senator Dick Durbin, was good for improving conditions at federal prisons. And now we need that same relief plus more for our state prisons. So the first step, shorten mandatory minimums for nonviolent offenses. What else? It eliminated the use of restraints on pregnant women. It also encourages placing people uh, in prisons that are closer to their families and even expanding rehabilitative programming. And so it is a first step for a reason, right? And the second step, I believe, needs to look at root causes for incarceration and also emphasize the importance of prevention. On a community level, we need to devote more resources and provide greater services to families who are in crisis or at risk of a crisis. Most women behind bars are in prison for low level, nonviolent offenses. And a lot of these offenses are the result of drugs, which can be the result of self coping mechanisms because an individual does not have access to the mental health care. So a history of trauma can also lead to substance abuse. And so it's important that a second step helps to bridge that gap between resources in mental health care, as well as child care jobs and other impactful areas. I believe that the next step should also include uh, further criminal justice reforms, such as reforming our sentencing guidelines and even addressing the physical conditions of our prisons and their infrastructure. We need to address our law enforcement training and more reentry efforts. We also need to continue to address the disparities widened by the failed war on drugs, right? Um, the crack and cocaine disparities, marijuana records, and dis and expungements. I also think it's important to expand Ban the Box and to even reinstate the right to vote for those previously incarcerated in states where they've lost that right. Um, this reminds me of a bill that I passed in Illinois called the Re-Entering Citizen Civic Education Act because I was tired of men and women coming home from prison in Illinois believing that they had forever lost their right to vote, to participate in this democracy, to help to organize their communities, and to help us pass new policies that are needed to address these very concerns that we are talking about here today. So when thinking about gender-specific solutions, it's about addressing all of these same items, but at looking at it through a gender lens, right? So really honing in on what special allocations or programs must be made for women and a applying them where needed. And again, it's also about making sure these expansions are also made on state levels and applied to state state departments of corrections. Ms. Johnson, do you have a, I think I might ask you too, your, your views on, you know, I know the First Step Act was important to you. What, what do you think a second step should be? Or what, what do you think federal uh, Congress needs to look at next? Well, one thing for sure, they need to look at bringing parole back into the federal system. Many people think that in the federal system, parole already exists. That is why I was given a life without the possibility of parole because there's no parole in the system. Now I ask you, what is the difference between a state prisoner and a federal prisoner? There is no difference other than they have an opportunity of redemption. Well, another thing that they need to look at is looking at those those prisoners who do not benefit from the First Step Act, because as Representative Harper said, it's mainly geared toward the nonviolent prisoners. But there are prisoners who are listed in their cases as violence when there may have been a gun and there was not even a uh, 
nothing that no firing of the gun, a gun in their possession. So they are not eligible for many of the things that are in the First Step Act. So I think that it needs to look back at people that have served a certain amount of time, have rehabilitated, take another look at those uh, individuals. And it does not go far enough and it has some mandatory minimum things in it, but it does not go far enough. The mandatory minimum sentencing was one of the worst things that could have happened because it literally put a rubber stamp. You could not compare one person and what drove them. Everyone was looked at the same. And so there was not as much judicial discretion in sentencing. And just looking at the things that have come out of the First Step Act, it's been wonderful. Many people, you've got thousands who have been reunited with their families, but there's a whole group who have been left behind. And one of the things you probably know that I've been doing is I've really been pushing for clemencies. Uh, when I came out of prison, Kathy, one of the things that women asked me, they asked me, Miss Alice, please don't forget about us. And I have not. At every opportunity, I'm lifting up the women who I left behind, even though I'm fighting for the men also who have been left behind. I'm fighting especially for the women who've been left behind. And this past February, I was successful in helping to gain clemency for three women who I was advocating for. There were others that, that I continued to advocate for. These were three women who I was incarcerated with. I, you could say I was incarcerated with their children because when one person goes to prison, their entire family goes with them. So I had an opportunity to see their children in visitation room. As my family would visit me, I saw their children growing up in the visitation room. They were growing up while their mothers were in prison. So this was a wonderful victory that I celebrated with them to see them like myself, rejoin with their families. That has been a, a mission of mine, is to try to bring more mothers home. I don't know if you're aware that during the whole clemency project 2014, there were 1,715 grants of clemency sentences that were commutated, that were shortened, commuted, that were commuted. Out of that over 1,700, only 105 were women. Mm. They were the ones who were left behind and, and forgotten about, really. And so that's what I've been trying to make sure that we, we don't let that happen again. That we So the first group of women, the first group that I advocated for were the women. And that was the first group that came out. And just last week, five others received their clemency mm. who I advocated for. So I, when you say tireless, I'm tired, but I'd rather be tired and free than rested and in prison. Wow, what an incredible legacy that you're leaving. That's just really very inspiring to hear that you're continuing to do that. Thank you. Um, Ms. Turk, I might, uh, because we're filming this at right in the middle of this pandemic, I wanna make sure that we get to a question about COVID-19 and how prisons are addressing COVID-19 and what can we do to improve these terrible conditions that exist right now? Well, over the past eight months, I have witnessed up close and personal the horrors of our system. And what I'd like to say first, it is our job and our duty to ourselves and to one another to find as many pathways to justice as possible and change the conditions that may have sentenced folks, especially women, to years in prison. But we didn't sentence them to life, which is what we're doing. And a justice system that not only interrupts and eradicates harm done by inequity, but that that absolutely puts the lives, the very lives of our women in danger has, has to be changed. We have to create a justice system that takes incarcerated women and men, for that matter, 
and gives them a space where not only they can heal and hope and thrive, but they won't die. We don't have control over how many lives COVID takes, but we certainly can have control over how many get to live. And that can be done by, first of all, taking every single person that is over the age of 55 and release them because those are people who are at risk. Then taking people who have underlying conditions, whether they're diabetic or they have high blood pressure or they are cancer survivors and sending them home. There is no reason we can't increase supervised release and have people in the safety of a place where they can social distance, which is impossible in prison, where they can have medical care if they need it, which is almost non-existent, where one is told, ah, eh, you're overweight, take two Tylenol, and they're ignored. There is no way that people uh, can, can exist this way, not to mention the mental trauma of knowing on a daily basis that there's no not available testing, that when somebody does test positive, there's no place to hide. There's communal, you know, cooking and eating and bathroom sharing. And, you know, I worked over the course of the last uh, months in getting some of these women released. And I'm proud to say that 33 women, 33 cases that we worked on, these women are now home, all 33 of them. And that was because of tireless effort in blurring the enemy lines. We are not in death here. We are not talking about policy. We're not talking about people's opinion. Uh, you know, I've heard everything from prosecutors saying, you should have thought about that when you committed your crime. We're talking about life and death. And in these 33 cases, what I was surprisingly and wonderfully happy to see were judges who realized they sentenced these women to a certain amount of time, but not to death prosecutors, correctional officers coming across lines, speaking to victims in those particular cases, imploring them not to have the blood of a dead woman on their hands. This is what needs to happen more. I think the conditions that I see every day and hear about on core links and in emails have to be exposed to the news media. More of the public needs to understand the horrific conditions that exist within these prisons where women have no chance with a contagious virus to protect themselves. They don't have proper hand sanitizers. They don't have masks. They don't have testing equipment. They're tr they're, there are even opportunities where they've been testing on, on people in our prisons, uh, experimental drugs. This is not okay. <clears throat> we need to have uniform medical care. We need to have real doctors, not just physician assistants. We need to have local hospitals. And we also need transparency. When an a, a incarcerated person takes ill, they are sent to the hospital and no one, because of security reasons, knows where that person is. Family members are usually informed by other residents risking, risking their standing in that prison and informing whether it be a husband or a wife through email or even risking a telephone call to say, your mother, your, your wife, has gone to the hospital. Many times we've experienced there being no transparency and we've had people dying alone in hospitals without their family members knowing even where they are. The current system is about punishment. It needs to be about rehabilitation. It needs to 
take all of this in a in a country that is the largest incarcerator in the world and stop it. You know, I was very involved in the First Step Act that you just spoke about. I went to the White House many times. I picketed. I worked across the aisles with Republicans and Democrats, senators, people from the bureaus of prison. I even have a current board member from the Bureau of Prison who's fighting to to take this not just to the second act, to the third, the fourth, and the fifth. Because unfortunately, right now, even our wonderful First Step Act that has sent home many people and shifted certain things, it's not being followed. Part of it was programming and better health care and mental health care. And none of that has happened with the excuse, well, COVID hit. Well, COVID is going to be around from what we're all hearing for another year or two or more. Why we need to stop sending women to prison? If they're first-time nonviolent offenders, they should be on home confinement. There is no reason to put their lives and that of their families in danger. If they're already incarcerated and they're older and they, they have underlying conditions, they should be sent home on home confinement. And if they've got lengthy sentences and they, you know, are violent, then they need to be in safe quarters living with out, I mean, they're being starved of food. I, I keep hearing all we've had is peanut butter and jelly for weeks. Dinner is dropped off in a brown bag. We're scared. We're afraid to shower. We don't know what germs. There's no cleaning supplies. There are no masks. This must change. It must change. Well, thank you for that, because you're right. I think there is just not enough information. The public doesn't really know how deplorable these conditions are. So thank you for making that clear and for continuing to shine a light on that. The, the numbers that have been put out by the Bureau of Prisons are incorrect. And I just, I, I just feel that should be on the record. Okay, the public does not know what's really going on. The families don't know what's really going on. We need at least transparency and we need to come together and unite as human beings. This is life and death. This is people who are worth more than the mistake they made. That is, that's really powerful. So Ms. Johnson, uh, earlier you talked about I know you talked about the federal system and you said it treats everyone the same. So I'd like to ask each of you this question, but start with you. I mean, how can we shift the paradigm overall from a one size fits all type approach to a supportive one um, from pretrial all the way through to probation? Yes, it must start. I'm glad that you said that, Kathy, because it's not just once a person is incarcerated. It must start with the initial arrest and what they're being arrested for. There are so many federal laws on the books that for minor things, you can get caught up and get terrible consequences for things that are very minor. And that would, encap that would include sentencing reform and also the abilities for judges to have more discretion. The mandatory minimum sentencing guidelines were some of the worst things that have ever been passed because it does treat people with a one size fits all approach. And once they're incarcerated, our focus must not be the punitive part of it so much. The, the focus must be more rehabilitative and there must be not just programs, but programs that are working once a prisoner gets out that they have a pathway to success. One of the things that we do in my organization, Taking Action for Good, is when they come out, we help returning citizens gain what we call their freedom legs. And that is what we want. We want them to be a success. We want to be able to connect them with employers who have second chance hiring in place. And I'm very thankful that the Fair Chance Act was passed in the federal system so they're not locked out of federal, good paying federal jobs. So we have much work to do. 
One last thing, I believe that we need to address re-entry from a holistic approach. Families must become involved in re-entry because oftentimes they play a role in that person failing in re-entering society because they have unrealistic ex expectations that the same person who went into prison is going to come out as the same person who left. So you have to approach it from a holistic standpoint and we have to really address some of the collateral consequences that a person faces once they are free. So we have much work to be done and I, all of us play a role in getting that work done. Thank you very much. Uh, Representative Harper? Yes, um, I believe that there's definitely not a one size fits all solution here. And that when it comes to criminal justice reform overall, and especially as it um, relates to women, we should be casting our nets out far and wide, seeing what best practices may be out there, or in some cases, working to innovate something new. So I just want to quickly highlight some things that we've been doing in Illinois. One thing that I, that I really am happy about is we have a new lieutenant governor who has started a new justice, equity, and opportunity initiative housed in her office that solely concentrates on these issues, brand new it's only been around for a year now. And so um, because she had a background in criminal justice reform, and this was one of her passions as a rep, now as lieutenant governor, her whole, her whole mission and goal is to, one, address the social determinants of crime and incarceration, two, improve the equitable deflection and diversion opportunities from the justice system, three, improve the conditions and address the needs of vulnerable populations inside correctional facilities, and four, to support positive re-entry outcomes to reduce recidivism. I think that it's wonderful that this is her, her office's job to do um, all day, every day. And I think that this is something um, that we can continue to grow and even replicate. A couple of other things I wanted to highlight as some made of innovative solutions and things that maybe we need to explore um, is that we instituted a trauma-informed training uh, for our correctional offices here in the state of Illinois. And we also uh, passed a brand new act called the Women's Correctional Services Act, which created a permanent Women's Correctional Services uh, Division within our Department of Correction and provides statewide oversight and authority for all of the women's correctional facilities, also helping to develop evidence-based trauma-informed policies to govern uh, women. And so I even want to stretch our minds across the ocean just to look at some of the things that they're doing um, over. For example, in, in South Africa, their Supreme Court ruled um, that sentencing for primary caregivers of young children, the kids in these cases were 8, 12, and 16, if they they ruled that the best interests of the child were paramount. And so they began allowing suspended sentences for their mothers in some cases. And in Russia, female prisoners convicted of certain offenses considered less serious or nonviolent can have their sentences deferred until their children are of age 14. And so there, are, while there are not um, many different things, I think on a state level, even in Illinois, I've, I've seen some of our community-based organizations pick up where the state has left off. And I think that we can look at some of those organizations for some things that can be replicated or we can fund on a state and federal level. For example, there's an organization called Chicago Legal Advocacy for Incarcerated Mothers. It's a nonprofit agency specifically to help women prisoners and their children maintain contact. So I think there's going to be programs like these and new ways of looking at our men and women in the criminal justice system and, and also the way that we think about the communities, right, that they come from. I believe that the most innovative the most innovative solutions that we have here uh, have to do with justice reinvestment and economic investment in the communities that these women come from, right? These are my neighbors that we're talking about. These are people in, people in my family. So I believe that when we have true economic equity, 
wage equity, educational equity in all of our communities in this country, then we won't have people forced into alternate economies or abused and mis used to be led down certain paths, right? I believe we have to drastically improve the quality of life for all residents, especially residents in these disproportionately impacted communities, communities ravaged by the war on drugs and communities where we see a big number of uh, people going to prison and returning home from prison. What does the support in these communities look like, right? Um, that's also a really big thing that we have to think about when we're talking about uh, reinvesting in the criminal justice system or any of the reforms that go along with it. And of course, more importantly, how we can best serve uh, um, and protect mothers and their families who are involved in this criminal justice system. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Turk? I, I think, I think you know, what we have to do is fundamentally change the whole current system, um, which tends to pathologize and further dehumanize the people it should be serving, especially women. There are very specific pathways that lead women to justice involvement, and without getting into them right now, these are the one-size-fits-all solutions that dehumanize. A woman who has an addiction issue is a very different woman than a woman who came from a domestic violence. Now, they may, she may have both, which makes it even worse, but women really need to be um, responded to as individual human beings. And we need to approach them from a very resourceful point of view, collaborating with them and finding out not what we think they should or have to do, but nurture their innate well of resources and help them uncover what it is they really want to do. Because let's face it, everyone, you know, when somebody tells you what you should do, maybe you do it for a week or two or five, you lose five pounds, whatever it may be. But when you do something you really want to do, you get up and you do it every day and you get up early to do it. And I think there's some, some really basic tenets of this, seeing people as whole, not broken, valuing their diversity, understanding their different places. And imagine, can you imagine if it didn't matter where you came from, but you were, you people brought their curiosity to, to, to who people really are and really tapped into their resourcefulness and, and created the natural openings that come with seeing people as individuals and really healing that individual pain so we can completely heal the, the ripple effect that we've talked about throughout this panel and how it affects the children and the spouses and the elders and the community and bringing all that, you know, that into the community. You know, how many times we've set up programming uh, over the last seven years since I've been home and the neighborhood said, not in my backyard, not in my backyard. So there needs to be what you hear at Verizon are doing today, education to really let people understand. We're talking about human beings here that, again, I'll say are more than their mistake. And one of the ways that I think we can accomplish this is to bring formerly incarcerated women into the Bureau of Prisons, into all of these agencies, not just as visitors every once in a while when it looks good for a photo op, but in real working sessions, in changing and overhauling. So the minimal that looks good isn't just all that happens and that real change can occur. Well, thank you for that. Um, I think that's a good place to stop. I wanna thank all three of you for really an incredible discussion. And I learned a lot. I hope everybody watching learned a lot. And also I wanna thank all of you just for the work that you're doing to really change what is a fundamentally broken system. And thank you so much for being here. It was a pleasure to talk to you and to meet you. And I hope we can continue this discussion 